Hi, everybody. I'm Karen Hartglass. You're listening to It's All About Food. Today, we are celebrating 14 years of broadcasting on the Progressive Radio Network. And that's a party. Woo! There's nobody else I would rather party with than probably my most favorite guest on this show and co-host, Gary DiMattei. Woo! 14, Woo! 14 years. years! Karen, congratulations! How does that happen? It's all about food has been broadcast or podcasting, I should say, for 14 years. But it wasn't called a podcast 14 years ago, was it? Well, on the Progressive Radio Network, I called it a radio show. In 2009, podcasts were really in their infancy. And now it's now it's a thing. Everybody has a podcast. All the major media outlets have lots of podcasts. And yeah. And we're still doing what we've been doing all the time, although it has changed a bit. I used to do it a lot through Skype. I would connect with the station through Skype, or I would go into the studio. And a lot of the programs were live, and the guests would call in or Skype in, and we would record it through Skype. And Skype was really a, kind of the leader in that sort of thing at the time. Right. And then COVID happened, and nobody wanted to go in the studio. <laughs> And the studio is in Manhattan. Studio is in Manhattan. Let's tell everybody that we podcast from New York City and now all over the world because you can. And because you can. Yeah. And right. Zoom has really changed things because Zoom is easier to work with than Skype, although Skype has probably come up to speed now too. But I don't use Skype anymore. I use Zoom and I pre record most of my interviews and then. They're broadcast on Tuesdays at 4 p.m. Eastern Time on the Progressive Radio Network. And we're glad about all of that. A shout out to the Progressive Radio Network. Woo! Gary No and Company. This is awesome. What a great relationship you have with TRN. Yeah, I'm, I'm giving everybody some virtual hugs here from yeah. Zoomland. <laughs> so podcasting has changed or broadcasting has changed and now it's podcasting. Over the years, over the 14 years, let's talk about some of your favorite interviews. I mean, I know interviewing me has always been your favorite, and why wouldn't it? It is my favorite. I love I'm, talking to you. What you do when you interview someone is, I mean, 75% of the time, if not more, they've written a book, and you actually have read their book before you interview them, which is remarkable. You, I've read a lot of books. <laughs> you've read a lot of books. And they've been fascinating books, right? Uh, For the most them. part, yes. Some of them were not so fascinating, and I just had to be polite to the author. Right. And my, and my question out there to my listeners is, can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you find something about every book. That, that is you worthwhile. Enjoy. Yeah, yeah, I try. I try. I try to do a positive spin on things. I'm not like your classic media today where they try and go sensational and insult everybody. Not my style. No. No, no, no. You bring out you bring out the best in everyone. I've picked a bunch of interviews that I really enjoyed. Oh, good. I like this part. And many of them, I wanted to say that many of them were related to the books that I read that I enjoyed. But that was not always the case, only sometimes. All right, well, it, let's go down this list because it's- It's a long, well, it's a you know, long 14 list. years. It, there, I talked to a lot of people and I didn't pick everybody, but I just picked a few. You picked these names because you felt that the interview went extremely well. The list that I made, I've enjoyed the book if they had a book. And then the subsequent conversation. Yeah, I think both, but not all of these people that we're going to talk so about. So I guess what both. I'm getting at is, is there a criteria to make Karen Hartglass's list? What is your criteria? <laughs> so a well, good interviewer and a good interview and a good book. Yeah, I think so. Both. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. let's start with your list here. Jim May. Okay. Tell the first about... person is Jim May, right? He didn't have a book. Right. So what did Jim, what was Jim about? Who was Jim and why should we listen to the archive of Jim May? Yeah, he's the founder of Sweet Leaf Stevia. And he taught me that the sweetener is called Stevia, not Stevia. But maybe in the United States, we call it Stevia. And maybe in Latin American countries, they call it Stevia. 
but I call it stevia now because he taught me it's called stevia. But I found it fascinating. He told the story of bringing stevia to this country. And just like so many stories with food, there's politics and right. capitalism and right. misinformation and exploitation. <laughs> and there was all of that. How fun. That sounds like a mystery, a Netflix mystery. Well, kind of, you know, he he discovered stevia, which I mean, people know about today. And we know about it mostly because he brought it here and he fought to get it approved for human consumption. It was approved, I think, to put on our skin or other reasons, but it wasn't approved to consume. And so he struggled for a long time and it was competing with aspartame the artificial sweetener. Right. And that's one of the reasons why he couldn't get it approved because those in power didn't want it to compete with this synthetic sweetener. And he had a really hard time for a long time, but he finally got it approved. And then of course the big corporate companies wanted to jump on it and they made their own products, kind of blending it with artificial sweeteners. They did a number of different things to create their own products. That was Jim May. It was fascinating. You can go and so and so stevia is something that were that you feel isn't. I mean, it doesn't contain cyclamates and lots of these other things that people want to stay away from when they when they talk about artificial sweeteners. You think it's a pretty clean product, and you would recommend it if someone was trying to get off sugar. Maybe a little stevia or stevia in their in their tea is not such a bad thing. That is a great question. Mm -hmm. And I have maybe an answer that you weren't expecting. Or maybe okay. you knew because you know everything. The thing about stevia, there hasn't been a lot of research. So we don't know how good or bad it is. I, there's a number of them out there, but it's not really conclusive. From the people that I follow, the idea of making things sweet that aren't naturally sweet is not a good thing, whether it's sugar or maple syrup or honey or stevia or erythrodiol or, or these artificial aspartame. And what's the other one? What the old fashioned one in the, in the, in the little pink bag. Oh yeah. The sweet and low. What is that? What yeah, is sweet, sweet and low? Saccharin. Saccharin. Right. Okay. So Saccharin. The, the man-made ones, of course, we don't want to touch. They do all kinds of bad things. But just the need for sweetening things does not send the good message to the brain or the gut. So it's not really encouraged. We should be eating naturally sweet foods, fruits. If we want to sweeten something, we should be sweetening it with whole fruits, maybe dried fruits which are also very sweet and we want to minimize consuming them because they're very, very sweet and they're dehydrated. So they don't have the water in them that yeah. natural fruits have in them. Anyway, I, so I would flunk that class. I would flunk, <laughs> I would flunk that class because I eat a lot of dried fruit. You eat a lot of raisins. You love your raisins and that's fine. Yeah. Give yeah. Me a bit. It's okay. I think they're good for you. Anyway. So the thing about stevia is it's not, a bad sweetener on the whole, but I would recommend backing off from adding sweeteners to things. And it's not a highly processed sweetener either, correct? It's uh, well, it depends on how you get it. Yeah. So I think so. If you uh, got it from Jim May, it would probably be as probably be the best minimally processed as yeah. possible. The All minimally right. processed stevia is in the leaf form. If right. You just get the leaf, but I find it has a an aftertaste that I don't particularly care for. Well, most artificial sweeteners do, I've found. Mm -hmm. And you know, artificial sweeteners and I go way back to my childhood because I'm, and maybe some of the listeners out there can relate, but when I was a kid, diet colas were the thing I would go to because I was overweight. My family bought lots and lots and lots of diet colas. So I was drinking, I was drinking cyclamates long before they were outlawed by the FDA. <laughs> yeah, I have cyclamates running in my my veins. Oh, they're I, long gone, Gary. They're long gone. I am a cyclamate. <laughs> That's actually a pretty good title. Cyclamate. Who even remembers cyclamates? So I just want to add one thing about the ingredient cyclamate, because I found it fascinating. Cyclamate is approved as a sweetener in at least 130 countries. And in the late 1960s, cyclamate was banned in the United Kingdom 
but it was approved after being reevaluated by the European Union in 1996. And in the Philippines, cyclamate was banned until the Philippine Food and Drug Administration lifted the ban in 2013, declaring it safe for consumption. Cyclamate remains banned in the United States and South Korea. And that's interesting to me because usually the United States does not ban things when the European Union does. So what do you think? Do you think cyclamate is something you want to consume? I'll just leave that right there. Okay. Number two on your list. And I really like this guy too. I think he's terrific. John Joseph. Talk to me about John. Who is John for those people who don't know? John okay, Joseph. He's authored a number of books, but the first book he came out with was a bit controversial because of the title Meat is for Pussies. And yeah. there are many feminists, including people like Carol Adams, who I have tremendous respect for, tremendous respect, really didn't care for this title. I have mixed feelings about it. And I understand where the feminists are coming from, and I support that. But I also understand where John Joseph was coming from, and I kind of understand that. But I really appreciate him and his story, not necessarily the title of his book, because he had an absolutely horrific childhood and early adulthood. Horrific. He went from foster home to foster home and he was treated poorly. I'm just, you know, giving a quick summary, but his story is powerful. And he turned it all around. He became a hardcore vegan. He's also a punk rocker. And we learned that veganism is connected to the vegan message from yeah, and Moby's, um, Moby's recent film. Which we're going to talk about later on. Absolutely. Later in the show, we'll talk about Moby's film. But yeah, keep going about John. He has this PMA thing, positive mental attitude. And yeah. that's all he's about. I don't agree with everything he does or says. I don't agree with his politics and a lot of things. But he is somebody who came from the worst possible scenario and has made great things from it. And yeah. his book, his books are inspiring to to a lot of people, people who have been in those situations and and have been inspired and and, and have learned a lot. He's a musician as well, as you mentioned, and his band was called the Crow Mags, or it still is, maybe. Maybe they're right, still active. Yeah. He's an author. Then I met him first time in that interview. I invited him in the studio. Like it you was, said, he he really turned it around and he's now a triathlete, right? He competes. I mean, the absolutely. guy- Absolutely. Yeah. Iron Man's all over the place. Yeah. yeah. Positive mental attitude. And he's very controversial, And but it was a, it was a good interview. And yeah. so we should look for that one also on the archives. And I keep bringing this up because all of these interviews that Karen will be talking about are archived at Responsible Eating and Living. And you can go Many there- Many of them with transcripts. Mm -hmm. With transcripts, right. Okay, next on your list, Steve Brill Wildman. Wildman Steve Brill. I just think he's just a fun character and very knowledgeable. And he's somewhat known in New York City because he gives these, these nature tours. So that's and what his his thing is nature. Is he like a Yule Gibbons disciple, something he, like that? He's a forager and he's okay. always into finding what you can eat down the street. So he used to give tours in Central Park. I'm not sure if he still does. And he talks about his story. I think he they wanted to arrest him or something. And he was quite clever. And in the end, he was approved to give his tours, but not without some challenge and trouble. And he's just yeah. a lot of fun. And he wrote a cookbook also. Foraging New York is one of his books. The Wild Vegetarian is one of his books. Identifying and Harvesting Edible and Medicinal Plants. Yeah, we have the Wild Vegetarian Cookbook. And it's a big, thick book. And it's it's great. That's essentially what a forager is, right? They go around and they go to parks and, and trails and things. And they see what food is edible and what isn't. Yeah, and I just think that's good knowledge to have. Really good knowledge to have. Yeah. If you were getting lost in the forest with someone, you would want to be lost in the forest with Wild Man Steve Brill. Wild Man Steve Brill and possibly one of my dear friends, Mike Boss. Ah, yes, Mike Boss. <laughs> Absolutely. You've interviewed Mike Boss over the years, too. And I I'm have, sure. but I didn't put him on this list. That's okay. He'll forgive you. Next on your list is... Tell us about Barry Estabrook. Who is okay. Barry Estabrook? Okay, you might remember him because not only did we interview him on the Progressive Radio Network, but we did a video, a video. that's on our yeah. website. I was He's the tomato guy, right? Right. He wrote Tomato Land. 
Tomato land. And right. he's not somebody promoting a vegan diet. No, no, no. Although he should. He should. <laughs> but he talked about the exploitation in of, growing of tomatoes. Tomato, of tomatoes, the exploitation of tomatoes. That kind of makes me chuckle, but it's a serious business. It, it is indeed. And it has improved since he's written the book. Right. But you can read all about or read or hear about that in that interview. But I always like to say that every food has its story. And tomatoes, especially in the United States, has a story. Tomatoes, I remember he was saying the tomatoes in Florida, there's like a law that they have to be perfectly round to sell them or to export them or something like that. A certain size, a certain roundness. Yeah. Yeah. That was a great fun making that video. I remember we made that upstairs at Blossom on 19th. Right. Remember that? Yes, I do. We shot it upstairs at Blossom, but that Blossom is no longer there. But there are other Blossoms. Blossom is a restaurant for those of you who think we're talking about the actual flower and we're not. (laughs) All right, now you have two names together here, Joel Furman and Michael Greger, both doctors. Yeah, now I've interviewed them a lot, and I'm sure everybody's listened to them on one podcast or another or conferences. They've both been very generous with their time over the years, and they have similar messages in terms of the best plant-based diet out there, but I love them both. They're just good people, and I always refer to both of their websites for information, and it's just always been a pleasure talking to them. And That's terrific. You've, yeah. you've done a lot of interviews with both of them. You have also been friends with both of them for many years. Yes. Yeah, they started in the movement long ago when uh, you yeah. started as a trailblazer. Yeah. I met them both in the mid-90s. And they're both vegans, vegan doctors, correct? Yes, yes. And I think Michael now has some food. Doesn't he have a line of food? A he line does. Of- it's called Leafside. I haven't tried it, but it looks really good. Awesome. All right. Going on, we have a big list here. Bava Ram. Now that sounds like a dessert. Hi, I'll have the Bava Ram. But it's not. It's an actual person, right? It is indeed. And another fascinating story. I read the book. This guy was originally a journalist with a different name. <laughs> And then went through this incredible journey and had horrible back problems. He wrote a book called Warrior Pose. His career ended due to a broken back and he had failed surgeries and he was disabled and heavily medicated and it was a disaster. And he turned things around. Completely. With yoga and meditation. It's a crazy book. I'm reading it now and it's amazing. Now that was 10 years ago. I love this book and I recommend it for everyone. As Karen just mentioned, it's called Warrior Pose. It's really an inspiring book. And the interview that you do with him, that you did with him is great. It's really great. I agree. Good one, Karen. Okay, here's two more (laughs) names together. Brenda Davis and Visanto Molina. Sounds like a law firm, doesn't it? Brenda Davis and Visanto Molina. It's not a law firm. They are two Canadian dietitians who have done groundbreaking work throughout the decades when it comes to nutrition. And they're both wonderful people. We're hoping to see Visanto in New York in May. Yes. And I'm going to have them both on the program very soon because they have a new book out. Oh, excellent. So check out the interviews with Brenda Davis and Visanto Molina. They're, they're just so informative all the time. They're just a tremendous wealth and they're just lovely. I, I don't know what else to say. Well, I mean, we, you talk a lot about dietitians and how that it's just, you know, they don't really know what they're talking about as far as you're concerned. But these two, you speak very highly of. And for you to speak that highly of anybody, they've got to be good. I know we've had a lot of discussions about, you know, hospital nutritionists, for exactly. example. And how they're just like so... They don't know anything. Misinformed, clued out. Well, either... Uh, I don't know what they're there for. The ones that I've met, because I've been in hospitals treated for cancer. They didn't know what foods nourish the body. They didn't know what foods caused cancer. And I don't know if maybe they did know, but they were told a certain line that they were supposed... I don't know. And because, because you do know what they should be telling folks... 
when someone comes to you that has a cancer question, you just level them with the truth. And a lot of folks can't handle that because they'll come back and say, well, my nutritionist in the hospital yeah, says so that I should not. I should be eating lunch meat. And you you let one them of the know. most frustrating things we heard this recently, Gary. You know what I'm talking about. But right. for a long time, conventional doctors, especially oncologists that treat breast cancer, would tell their breast cancer patients that they could not consume soy because soy contains estrogen and that would not be good for their breast cancer. And that couldn't be further from the truth. And even the American Cancer Society, which is not an organization that I'm that I look for for information. They no, are so conservative. Yeah. But even they will tell you that soy is safe and soy helps reduce risk of recurrence and cancer. Soy is an okay food. Now that is whole soy and minimally processed soy like tofu, tempeh, edamame, soy milk, miso, those kinds of things. It's mind boggling how many people come up to you and say, well, I, I'm supposed well, to, I'm not, can't eat soy. Some people do listen though. We did a video. I, I'm saying to you, Gary, you know, but of course, you know, we did a video together, the soy story and we right. talk a lot about that. That's on our website as well. So mm -hmm. check it out. Okay. Next on the list, Evita Oshel. You know, one of my listeners recommended that I seek out Ovita Oshel. I never heard of her, Evita Oshel. I didn't know about her. I checked out her websites, her information. She had some books and we had a few conversations and I adored her. I adored her her approach to life and her information. It was just such a joy. Sometime if we make it to Canada, I hope we can meet her. Yeah. Like a health Promote coach? a healthy lifestyle, diet and lifestyle. Very cool. Yeah, Wonderful. but it's just her, her manner. Just really enjoyed her. So it was a good interview. Yeah. Check it out, everybody. Evita Oshel. Evita, like the musical by Andrew Lloyd Webber, last name Oshel. <laughs> Next on the list. Antene Roba. Yeah. Antene Roba. I really enjoyed my conversation with him. He is a physician and the founder of the International Fund for Africa. And it's based in Houston. And he's just done a lot of wonderful work and continues to, I believe. I haven't checked him out in a while, but the International Fund for Africa is still around. They're helping women and children in Ethiopia. And they're all about nutrition, education, healthcare, sanitation. Wonderful. But I just enjoyed my conversation with him. Yeah. He made the list. Dr. <laughs> Roba made the list. Wow. All right. Next on the list, Will Potter. Now, Will, I loved his book, Green is the New Red. Will is an independent journalist. He focuses on eco-terrorism, the environment, animal rights movement, and he just tells it like it is. And yeah. I really admire his bravery and the work that he's done. His book talked a bit about animal rights activists and some of the events that they had that got a few of them into prison for a long time. And he talked about the laws that were put in place as a result, laws that I don't think are very good. Yeah, I remember um, listening to that interview with Will and really getting a lot out of it. And he's also all over the internet and YouTube, Yeah, et follow him on Instagram. Yeah, so check out Will. He's he's really powerful guy. Karen Davis, not to be confused with Brenda Davis. This yeah. is now Karen Davis. <laughs> now, Karen Davis... I've met several times. Yeah, correct? she used to be at the Veggie Pride Parade when we right. used to attend and exhibit there. She's a great activist. Amazing. An amazing activist. The yeah. founder of United Poultry Concerns. She knows everything about birds, especially the chickens and the hens that have been tortured in factory farms. Yeah. And uh, just tireless work. Wonderful. She's amazing. Yeah, I really like Karen. I like her work. I like what she talks about. You'll never look at a chicken the same way again after talking to Karen about mm. chickens. When yeah. I've interviewed her, I've always asked for some good stories, and she has wonderful bird stories that she shares. Karen Davis. Michelle McMacken. Michelle oh, wonderful McMacken. doctor. Dr. She Michelle worked, McMacken. I don't know if it's McMacken or McMacken, you know, I, you yeah. say McMacken, I say McMacken. She is now connected with work in New York City where they're taking a certain number of people that have diabetes and giving them lifestyle care, teaching wow. them what to eat and how to take care of themselves 
to reverse ultimately their illness. And our mayor, Mayor Eric Adams, is connected to that and supporting her work because he believes in plant-based diet, but she's a powerhouse. She really is. And she, again, she's all over the internet as well. Lots of videos. Okay. Sarai Stancic. Dr. Stancic. Also, I spoke to her a couple of times. I spoke to her first when I had heard her story about how she had multiple sclerosis and basically turned it around with diet and lifestyle. And then later on, she came out with a wonderful book, What's Missing from Medicine, and another powerhouse with a great story. And these, Michelle is a doctor, Sarai is a doctor, mm-hmm. and they're both vegan doctors, correct? Yay, of course, yes. As is, as is Dr. Joel Furman and Dr. Michael Greger. Michael Greger, yes. Yeah. And Brenda Davis and Vasanto Molina are vegan dietitians. Yes. Yes, yes. Most of the people on your list are vegan. Most, but not all. You know, some of the authors whose books I've loved talk about food or the food system, but they're not vegan. And I yeah. always like to ask them, why aren't you vegan? And then they kind of squirm and don't really answer the question very well. Right. Here's a powerhouse vegan. This guy's huge. And your interview with him was phenomenal. Philip Wallen. Philip That's- Wallen. Yeah. I want to talk about him and Damian Mander because I think I had interviews with them kind of around the same time. Is Philip Wallen Australian? Yes. And he was in New York. And I just heard he was in New York. And I reached out and I said, I want to interview you. And he came into the studio. We had a wonderful time. And I can't tell you how wonderful it is to interview someone that has done so much great work and and be with them in the same room in person. Yeah. I, this, I love everybody this, I talk to, but to be in the same room is just so right. powerful. And this guy, he was a former vice president of Citibank and was also general manager at Citicorp. And he's a he's I would call him a hardcore vegan, wouldn't you? He's yes. An, and what did he say recently he's on his Facebook page? He was talking about the methods he use he uses to try and convince people to stop eating animals and he made it like there's five simple reasons where you should realize that you shouldn't eat animals. And he like lists all these other animals that we don't eat. Yeah, We don't eat all these animals. So all you have to do is add a few more to that list. Chickens, cows, pigs. Right, (laughs) right. I forget the two other ones he listed, but you got this long list of animals you don't eat. So just add a few more to that list. One of his quotes I think is really, really powerful. He's quoted a lot, and it's, we obey people we don't trust to buy things we don't need, Mm. to impress people we don't like, using money we don't have, (laughs) for gratification that doesn't last, killing animals we don't hate, for pleasure that doesn't satisfy, dreaming of a life we don't deserve, and praying for an afterlife that doesn't exist. We are a stupid species. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I mean, that's kind of telling it like it is, right? Indeed. Yeah. Yep. No, he's great. And your interview with him is wonderful. And then the other one was Damian Mander. And he's done some incredible work training people to work in jungles where there are poachers that oh, are killing yeah. elephants. And Isn't and- he also in, he's in a couple of documentaries. I think he's in the Game Changers. Isn't he's he? in the Game Changers. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, he... Is amazing individual. And I heard that he was going to be in New York. And so I met him in the studio. And just to be with that energy is yeah, he's just an very an- inspiring. He's an anti-poaching activist and the founder of the International Anti-Poaching Foundation. And he he's trains also- a lot of women too to be to fight these poachers. Awesome. He's director of Conservation Guardians. Yeah, this guy's he's this guy is really fighting the fight. Well, man. he was a soldier yeah. and he's seen the worst of the worst. So right. he's probably fearless. And he had this epiphany. Mm-hmm. He had this wake up call. And and this is what he's doing now. Also a vegan. Mm-hmm. David Young. Yeah, I also met him. He's um, Korean, Korean American. And He's working a lot in Korea, getting plant-based meats into the Korean restaurant and commercial market. 
and he's very successful. I'm ne not necessarily a big supporter of plant-based meats. I think we should be eating simply greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, seeds. You know who I follow. But he's doing some good work. And I commend that. And he had a lot of great energy. It was a fun well, interview. Well, you know, plant-based meats, they say, help people transition off the animal. I don't know. I think the that maybe they are just a novelty and people will still go back to eat eating meat. Because I think if we keep supporting the taste of animals, that people are just going to say, well, this is fine and fun and kind of interesting for the night, but I'm going to go back to eating animals because I want that taste. And we're never really going to leave that taste if we keep inventing these plant-based meats that taste like animals. And I agree. That's the problem that I have with them. But I, I don't mind something that's chewy and flavorful. It just doesn't, it doesn't have to taste like animal though. Yeah. Okay. Susan Thompson made your oh, list. Yes. When I first spoke with her, I was blown away. Right. She is a powerful speaker. And as a result, she has built a very powerful organization. Now you may not agree with her, but she has helped a lot of people lose weight with her Bright Line eating program. Yes, she has. The Susan thing that, Thompson. The thing that doesn't work for me is she wants you to weigh your food and she wants you to have portion control. And maybe for those that are addicted and have addictive personalities, according to her, she says this is part of the plan. I don't have an addictive personality, so I don't know. But she knows a lot. She's been through a lot. She herself has been addicted to drugs. She's been to hell and back and she's doing wonderful work. Yes, she is. And I think you've talked to her more than once, haven't you? Yeah, I have. Here's a couple of more powerhouses, Dean and Ayesha Sherzai. Oh my goodness. They Doctors. are amazing. They are neurologists. They are married. They have two brilliant children who like were going to college at 13 and 15 years old, something crazy mm -hmm. like that. They are the dynamic duo. When I first heard about them and read their book, The Alzheimer Solution, it was life-changing because it was new information that we could prevent Alzheimer's. You hear that, everybody? With lifestyle and diet, correct? Yes. And they say 90% of all Alzheimer's can be prevented. And that's a brave statement. Right. And they back it up with a lot of science, don't they? They do. They are so smart. Right. And they're delightful. And they're great cooks. <laughs> and I love doctors who cook. Michael Greger cooks. Joel Furman cooks. And Dina and Yesha Sarazai cook. <laughs> Ian Thiesby and Henry for Oh, Bish Bash Bosch. Bish Bash Bosch. These guys are great. And they are cookbook authors. They are indeed cookbook authors. And- they're from the UK. Yes, they are from the UK. Right. Right. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> I used to talk to a lot of cookbook authors, and I don't talk to that many anymore because it's not that interesting to me. Occasionally, a really great cookbook will come out, but yeah. But I just found them really fun to talk to. I love their books. They were doing these great videos. You showed them to me. You pointed them out. They did mm -hmm. these like one minute videos where you were looking right. down on everything. Is there a they, special they name for they, those? They sort of pioneered the the video that now everybody uses. I mean, it's in it's it they play on the subways now, these these quick hack videos where in like 30 seconds you're watching an entire meal being made from an overhead shot. It's almost like a drone shot, but only a lot closer. And everybody's seen them now and, and they're, but these guys started this trend with yeah, food. With vegan and, food. Yeah. This video trend. And um, they're just they're, delightful. Yeah. Their cookbooks are colorful and well illustrated and photographed and they're fun and their recipes are great recipes. If you're wanting to transition off of the animal and I really like all of their books, Bish Bash Bosh. Check out Ian and Henry. Okay. And listen to the listen to the archive podcast at Responsible Eating and Living. We're getting close to the end of the list, but it's still got some great, great entries here. 
Encar Garcia Villa. Yeah, so my friend John Phillips recommended I speak with Encar Garcia Villa, and she is in Costa Rica. At the Jaguar Rescue Center. At the Here. Jaguar Rescue Center, rescuing wildlife and doing really wonderful work. And it was a pleasure speaking with her. Costa Rica has a special place in my heart. I love that country and I love all the nature that's still there. And it was just fascinating talking to her and hearing about the work that she's doing. And it's not easy work. And unfortunately, some of the injuries that are afflicted on animals have to do with the electrical lines that are in Costa Rica. And they and Costa Rica really needs to go back and redo a lot of their lines because they're exposed to wildlife and they can get harmed. So Excellent. they're doing work to kind of help. Somehow. And she's rescuing a lot of animals. Yeah. Fabulous work in car. Okay. Sheldon Krimsky, GMOs Decoded. Yeah, this was another fascinating one. So this guy is one of these really nerdy, heady, smart guys that writes very intelligently. And it's a whole conversation about GMOs and what they're about. And I really enjoyed talking to him and I learned a lot. And I certainly don't support genetically modified organisms. This book gave me more reason not to support them. Excellent. Timothy Wise, Eating Tomorrow, Agribusiness, Family Farmers, and the Battle for the Future of Food. Such a great book, Eating Tomorrow. First of all, love the title, right. Eating Tomorrow. It's a great title. It's so a, deep. Lots of so layers. Deep. Yeah. Lots of layers. And I follow him. I continue to follow his writing because he talks about oh, all the exploitation and all the devastation and all the help that the United States allegedly gives to Africa and South America, and Central America, and it's only doing damage. Wow. And of course, there's genetically modified foods in there and selling seeds and getting control of, of people's livelihoods and the way oh, they the grow kind. food and it's a very, it's sad, but he's done a lot of great work. It's heartbreaking. I mean, most of your interviews are, are very they're heart, heartbreaking. They're heartbreaking. And, uh, <laughs> but you know, you've, you're putting it out there. You're giving people the truth. And that's what responsible eating and living is all about is telling the truth. It's not soft selling anything. I mean, but this is all heartbreaking stuff and you've been doing it for 14 years. How have you stayed upbeat about all of this. Well, well I live with Gary DiMattei, who constantly uh, keeps yeah. me entertained. Yeah, right. <laughs> constantly keeps you entertained. No, you really do. You you, you have a, um, an incredible upbeat attitude about all this. And have you ever lost hope? I mean, I, that's a rhetorical question, and I can't think of any time. Well, that I don't ever... even know if I have hope. All I know is... Oh, you do. I think you do. I think you have a lot of hope. I... Preach what I believe can help humanity, mm -hmm. because well, this is all about humanity. This is not about planet Earth, because planet Earth will take care of herself. Right. But will planet Earth allow humans to continue to live on this planet? Right. And, you know, that's another thing. So if I still believe that humanity can evolve and survive well. And so get I, to I would call that. Place. I would call that hope. I would call that faith and hope in, in the future, in humanity. And yeah. um, it's remarkable. Okay. Ellie Lacks, The Gentle Barn. Oh, just another lovely person. She has one of these sanctuaries called The Gentle Barn. And another beautiful spirit. So many lovely stories at The Gentle Barn. I yeah. enjoy talking to her. You can hear them in the interview. Fabulous. If you if you need to hear something hopeful, something <laughs> uplifting, I she's gone through a lot too from her earlier, uh, her earlier life. A lot of people have have had challenges and difficulties and suffering, and then somehow they learn that life is better when you serve, when you're of service. What's that and thing that, you're always saying to be of service, right? That, and that's really the message here. Right. You're being of service you know, as well. There's a song I like, you've got to suffer if you want to sing the blues. Right. And it's not that. You've got to suffer. 
if you want to learn the me, what we're supposed to be in life and who we're supposed to be, and we're all supposed to be of service. That's what I believe. So the gentle, the gentle barn is a sanctuary. Is that what it is? Yes. Yes. And it's located here in the United States. Yes. Next on your list. And it's, we're getting close to the end here, folks. Ooh. Tom Philpot, Perilous Bounty, The Looming Collapse of American Farming and How We Can Prevent It. This was incredible, this book. Great book. He writes for Mother Jones, at least he did when I interviewed him. I don't know if he still is, but always these intense articles about things that are going wrong with the planet. He was another person I asked, why aren't you vegan? And but he, he wrote a power, he wrote a powerful book about the collapse of American book. farming and how we can prevent it. Yes. And he was talking primarily about how most of our food today is grown in like California, whereas the middle America is raising livestock and has has these confined animal feedlots and factory farms and how everything's out of balance. Right. And everything is concentrated so that if we lose something somewhere. We're in trouble. Yeah. And he talked a lot about flooding in California. Which is going on now. Which is going on now. If there's lots of rain, there's lots of flooding. Okay. And the damage that it will do to the farmland. Exactly. So check it out, Tom Philpot. Next on the list, Seth Tibbet in search of the wild tofurkey. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it was just such a fun book to read. And he's so much fun to talk to. You know, he's the founder of Tofurky. He recently retired. Or no, maybe he's not retired, but he, <laughs> as Gary will say, or he sold out. He didn't sell out. He sold <laughs> his company to a reputable company that he trusts will take care of what he created. And he's just a lot of fun to talk to. He makes a good product, especially for those folks that want to transition off the animal and still have their hofurky sandwich. Because he makes plant meats that are not intensely processed. Right. His plant meats are made from seitan or made from soy, but they're not like overly engineered. I just think they're better than Sell meat. Right. Sell meat. Definitely. <laughs> Don't sell me any sell meat. Ba-da-boom. Okay. Dr. Joel Kahn, lipoprotein little a. He had a section in a little cookbook and he talked about heart disease and how important it was to test for lipoprotein little a. And I learned so much from that interview and those few pages in that book. So there's a certain number of people that die from heart attacks and they have a high lipoprotein little a. And there are things that you can do. And sometimes just a whole food plant-based diet is not enough. And so he wants everybody to be tested for this. And of course, mainstream cardiology doesn't test. And that's what he is? He's a cardiologist? Yes, he's a cardiologist. Great. And he has his uh, practice... You can actually go to him if you want. Yes. Dr. Joel Kahn is in Michigan. Check him out. Joel Kahn, right here, Responsible Eating and Living Archives. Oh, Oh, this guy's great. Dr. Latef DJ Kavim Vita Eco Hip Hop. Yeah, that's it. He was on the show maybe last year. Mm -hmm. I just learned so much about hip hop and music and how... It can be used to teach people about history and inspire people and give people good direction. And one of the things that he did and does, I guess, is some of them their music, they distribute with seed packets. Wow, that is cool. Right? So you, you get a seed packet and that enables you to download the music or something like that. But he wants people to grow food and teaches people to grow food. And he was in the movie, They're Trying to Kill Us, uh, another great but depressing movie. Totally that, depressing. That focused on poor communities, communities with people of color and how they are food deserts. They don't have easy access to healthy food. And his music is amazing. It's great music. His music is amazing and it's very instructive. Francis, on being vegan and growing food. Yeah. Right. He's a vegan. Of course. Yes. Francis Moore LePay. Francis Moore LePay. 
So a great interview with her, wasn't it? Oh, I loved it so much. And she was so sweet and generous to me saying lovely, lovely things. But Frances Morton LePay, she is very well known, but I think she should be far more famous than she is. Everyone should know who she is. And I think they don't because she's a woman. But she wrote a book in the 70s, Diet for a Small Planet. Groundbreaking. 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 And she really, she and Marion Nessel, I think, really steered the direction of our food system on, well, at least how advocates for the food system to improve the food system, to improve food security, things like that, and, and nutrition. These two women, both incredible work and not as well known as they should be for what they've done because they're women. Spread the word, Francis Moore LePay. Jonathan Balcombe, Superfly, The Unexpected Lives of the World's Most Successful Insects. I remember you really liked this interview. Oh, I loved it because there was all of this information about insects and flies, of course, because this book primarily focused on flies. Oh, fascinating. And we really need those flies buzzing around, don't we? They don't need us. We need them. We need them. They can survive fine without humans, but without flies... They decompose everything and you, dead bodies would just pile up and not decompose. And they decompose things and turn them into things we can use. They recycle. Wow. And they do a lot. They also pollinate. They don't get credit for pollinating like the bees do because I guess they're not as cute, but <laughs> they also help pollinate. But they have crazy sex and <laughs> all kinds of wild relationships. So this would be an interview you might want to listen to first. (laughs) (laughs) Last two, the final two. Jim Mason, An Unnatural Order, The Roots of Our Destruction of Nature. Mm. That's a nice light title. (laughs) That's a humorous title. I read read Jim's book in the early 90s, I think, and it was a game changer. And then he put out a revised edition last year or the year before recently, and I got to speak with him. Now, I had met him at an event somewhere in the late 90s, and I told him how much I loved his book. He's a cool guy. What I want to say about the book, basically, is that he talks about agriculture since it started about 10,000 years ago and how it has changed the way humanity interacts with each other. And it created, kind of helped create this hierarchy concept, which is not really a good thing. (laughs) So we have man at the top, white man, and then women underneath men and then animals underneath women. and, And animals can be used as capital and wealth. And that kind of started the whole capitalism thing. And it all started from agriculture because the agriculture started the ability to kind of own things and have things to trade. And then the hierarchy came from there. It's just a fascinating book. And it's a fascinating interview. Yeah. And it, will, it won't make you depressed or anything. Just listen to it. It'll be <laughs> fun. And finally, you've already mentioned her when you were talking about Francis Moore LePay, Marion Nessel. Marion Nessel, Yeah. So she's had a fascinating history, and I didn't really know about her until I read her memoir and interviewed her about it. Just a great book. Ah, And she's a a professor at NYU, correct? Yeah, emeritus now. And she still gets to keep her awesome apartment in Manhattan. Right. But she's all about food food politics. Food Food politics, politics. Yeah, labeling. She's had a, a written a bunch of great books, but she's fascinating. I, she really helped focus the way a lot of people look at the food system today. Brilliant, brilliant mind. And now that's that's your short list. But yeah. I know I know there are others that, that so did, many didn't make the list, but wonderful, wonderful work over the last 14 years. And this is just scratching the surface of all of the folks that you've talked with. And Marion Nestle now, we're going to segue into a discussion that she wanted to have about Nestle. Marion Nestle spells her name the same way, 
but it's a completely different thing because we're talking about Nestle and yeah. more importantly, well, we're talking about water. I'm going to make it very brief because we've been talking for almost an hour, believe it or not. And I believe it. <laughs> the, the message is don't drink water or other beverages out of plastic bottles. That's my conclusion. But just to back up a little, companies like Nestle, Nestle in North America became Blue Triton brands. Right. Blue right. Triton. The company They're formerly operating. known the company formerly known as Nestle Waters exactly. North America today announced that it has begun operating under a new corporate name Blue Triton Brands. That was That was in hit. April of 2021. That was that in April of 2021, right? But they are evil. They have always been evil. You may remember Nestle was trying to convince mothers in developing nations not to breastfeed but to feed their babies formula, which was so challenging because the women didn't always have access to clean water to mix their instant baby milk formulas with, and breast milk is always better. But when it comes to water, there's droughts everywhere. There's droughts in Canada, there's droughts in Europe, and, and especially in France and in California. So many places there are droughts. And meanwhile, not just Nestle, there are other companies too that are continuing to bottle water from these places that are experiencing droughts. And they make a lot of money from pumping these waters from these communities that are suffering from drought and water scarcity. And very often they're not even charged or they're charged very little for the water. And it's so sad because water in plastic bottles uses so much more water than the water it, in the bottle. It's, it's tremendously wasteful. So yeah. please try and think when you're drinking not to go. And glass isn't much better. I'm not saying that you should buy water in glass. What I'm saying, what are you saying, Karen? What I'm saying is drink tap water. And you want to clean it at your tap. So get whatever kind of purification system you can afford. If it's if you can only afford a Brita, that's fine. Just change it regularly. We like distilling our water. And distilling has its drawbacks. It uses a lot of electricity. And somebody should come up with a more efficient way to distill water. But well, that's what we do here. They could be powered by solar, too. So It that's... could, in an ideal world. And there's right. reverse osmosis. There's charcoal filters. Under the sink, charcoal filters. They're very good. Yeah. Do something. Use your tap water and then put it in either a stainless steel bottle or a glass bottle. Not a plastic bottle. Plastic is bad news. That's Yeah, and I... because you said this before we went on the air, but you know we're lucky to have water piped to our homes. Absolutely. So, so let's use it. Just use it. Just yeah. And I it. just wanted to mention, while we're on the subject of water, if you want to know how good your water is, the Environmental Working Group has a website, ewg.org forward slash tap water, Environmental Working Group, ewg.org forward slash tap water. You can put in your zip code and find out about your local water. And that's you're amazing. going to be surprised. I, I learned so much just listening to your show, Karen. It's great. Oh, thank it's terrific. You. <laughs> and you'll you'll have that link for us on your site, right? Of course. And you know, we're really out of time, but somehow I'm going to make time. Uh, I just wanted to remind people about Moby's punk rock vegan movie. We talked to Moby a few months ago. The movie is out. It's free. You can find it on YouTube. Watch it. It's and you'll see and it's you'll see John Joseph, and he's in the movie. Yeah, there's a lot of great people in the movie, and he made Karen's list. And, and then he, the. Other great movie is Coffee Wars. Tell us about how much yes. you enjoyed that one. It was fun. It's about yeah. a vegan barista who takes on the world at the World Barista Championship. And it's fun it's and it promotes veganism. Re really a lot of fun. It's great. And then the final thing you want to talk about today is give blood. Yeah, you know, we we don't really talk about that. But I heard from a friend recently who's working with a local blood bank. That there's a critical shortage of blood. Inventories are below normal levels. I know I benefited from donated blood when I was going through cancer and I needed transfusions. And I know many people have. And if you can donate blood, you can donate every eight weeks. You can look for a local blood center in New York. We have the New York Blood Center. My friend works with 
vitalant.org, V-I-T-A-L-A-N-T.org, where you can organize blood drives, the Red Cross also. There are numerous organizations, but just something to think about. If you have nothing to do, give blood. Yeah. Don't eat blood, give blood. (laughs) Exactly. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be here all week. And finally, Candle is back. Oh, yes. We were there today. So one of our favorite restaurants of all time, vegan restaurants, was originally Candle Cafe, and then there was Candle 79 and Candle West. We love Joy and Bart, who created these restaurants. So much love in all of them, and the food is real and vegan and wonderful. And each of them disappeared for one reason or another in the last few years. And now the chefs are opening a new candle and it's at 388 Third Avenue at 28th Street in Manhattan. And Gary and I had lunch there. We did. And it was really, really great. It was to be really back. good. We missed Joy and Bart because they're not involved in it, but it was great to see the chefs and it was great to eat the food. Yeah. So if you're coming to Manhattan, you can go to Candle again. Check out Candle. Hey, Gary, this has been another It's All About Food. This has been fun, Going down memory lane. This is really fun. Congratulations. Happy anniversary. 14 years. Wow. And may you have another 14 years at least. You you know what? I'm just going to put this out to the listeners. If you've had a favorite show that you've listened to, It's All About Food, would you let me know? Yeah. Yeah. Info at realmeals.org. All right, Karen. All right, Gary, let's wrap this up. You've been listening to another episode of It's All About Food in its 15th year. We're starting our 15th year of broadcasting here. Gary, thank you for joining me. Everybody, thank you for listening. And have have a delicious week. week.